Hello and welcome to the second in our Screen Talk series of live discussions of hot topics affecting the global film industry. I'm Jeremy Kay, America's editor of Screen International. Today's session looks at how art house distributors are partnering with exhibitors on revenue sharing virtual cinema models in response to theatre closures amid the COVID-19 pandemic. In a moment, we'll hear from art house distribution leaders who will tell us about their initiatives and look at the broader opportunities and challenges facing their sector. First, a few housekeeping rules or notes. I will moderate a 30-minute discussion with our panelists before we open it up to questions from you, our live audience. If you have a question, please use the Q&A channel at the bottom of your screen rather than the chat room. And our online editor, Orlando Parfit, will be monitoring the questions. We'll try to get to as many as we can. And now a few words about our panelists. Eve Gavarro is Managing Director of London-based Modern Films, a female-led, social issues-driven production, distribution, and event cinema company, whose credits include Happy as Lazaro, Never Look Away, and Dirty God. In March, the company pivoted its streaming platform to support exhibition partners, kicking off with Venice Selection, The Perfect Candidate, and London Film Festival documentary, White Riot. Michael Rosenberg, is president of New York-based independent distributor film Movement. Theatrical releases have included Can Al Certain Regard entry After the Storm and Can Critics Week's selection O oh Lucy. Last month, the company launched its virtual cinema platform in partnership with Art House Convergence. The roster includes Polish Oscar nominee Corpus Christi and Icelandic Can Critics Week selection A White White Day. Richard Lorber is president and CEO of Kino Lorber a New York art house distributor whose roster includes this year's Berlin Golden Bear winner, There Is No Evil. After the theatrical release of Cannes Selection, Baccarat was cut short, Lorber launched Kino Marquis and made the Brazilian thriller, among others, available online. Now, we're waiting for Richard to join us due to a few technical issues, but we hope he'll be with us soon. But meanwhile, let's kick off uh, with Eve and Michael if you could both tell us a little bit about your initiative and the films that are on it, uh, ticket price, and give us a flavor of the participating theaters. Eve, why don't you start? Um, okay, yeah, because I think we reacted a little bit later than even the US models, because Kino Lorber and Film Movement announced what they were doing. And um, you said that we, we pivoted our release to uh, join with cinemas, but actually we didn't even have a streaming platform uh, a month ago. So we had a website, obviously, informational website, and we had a shop and we had e-commerce capability, but we didn't have any sort of streaming or alternative viewing platform within the modern films framework. So we, we <laughs> acted very quickly and, and created one because it was a decision to make. We had about 10 days before the release of this film, we had the perfect candidate to pull it, to hope that cinemas wouldn't close or to, to go online and carry on with the campaign. So we decided to, to carry on with the campaign because there is an infrastructure in the UK anyway around day and date. So we could, we could do that. Um, so we created a space of our own as a kind of neutral space. But first of all, we, we, per, we partnered with Curzon Home Cinema as an extension of the cinema space and virtual, virtual uh, viewing space. And then with the BFI player because they're a cultural space. Uh, and they were supporting the release. And then we thought, well, let's have our own one as a kind of neutral space because not all cinemas would want to maybe promote another competitor or a competitor. So we put all this together and contacted all the cinemas that were opening the film, the ones that we work with regularly and said, why don't you partner with us? You can still market the film as if you were going to open it, but uh, drive your audiences to, to our site and we'll do a revenue share model on, um, on the revenues that we, collect sort of reversing the distributor exhibitor relationship. So we did, we did all that very quickly in a matter of, of days and with that with, with not so much marketing, but what we did have is the release of the film and uh, all the reviews put a link to our website and the other two platforms. So that was a kind of built in way to drive audiences. Um, so we had a number that we had 40 sites sign up right away, cinemas, but we did it very differently that I know Michael and, and Richard will talk about the way theirs works and how, how ours works now and how it's evolving. But it's, we just have a drop down menu at checkout where you can select your local cinema. And most likely you've come to our site via marketing through them and uh, click on them and then we'll apportion part of the revenues to them. Our price point is 
9.99 pounds, so about 12, 13 dollars. Um, and we call that a premium VOD price point for now. And the idea again around only having it available on three platforms and at that price was potentially we could put films in cinemas when they be open, but we'll see what happens. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but it's just to show that really we, we reacted with one film, with one release, and then since then we sort of built a platform around it uh, and this partnership with cinemas and then also with other distributors who want to take part in it with us. Yeah, and the launch film, and, and then you've had a few other films coming on since then, of course. As you yeah, said. I mean, that's the main thing. We see that the driver, the first week was great. Lots of people, lots of streams, lots of questions, lots of activity, and then it sort of goes down. So we've been doing, and we can go into this later, but live events, and those live events are with partners, and those drive traffic. And we can see, you know, usually it's in the evening, it's one or two days before the event, uh, the weekends have a spike, you know, there's all these regular, uh, even when people are at home, of ebbs and flows of, of movement on, on the site and the transactions. Um, but the events make a big difference and new content makes a difference. So we don't have you know, enough new content on our own flowing through um, to keep it all fresh and new. So we're looking at ways of, of doing that through the events or through new films or through other distributors' films. So that's, I think that's key is keeping it new and, and in the news in some way. Yes, absolutely. Thanks for the introduction, Eve. And so, Michael, tell us a bit about your uh, program. Sure. Uh, well, we had we had a, a few films that were in theaters at the time. It was um, March March twelfth was when we closed our office, started working remotely, uh, and we had Corpus Christi in theaters, and it was doing quite well. And we had just opened the Wild Goose Lake in New York, and it was about to open in LA and a number of other markets. We had had Donna Flor and her two husbands from our film movement classics label playing in New York and Sonia Braga had just done a Q&A at the Quad Cinema uh, the night before or the week before I guess it was the night before um, we already had a, a, a platform to use because we had launched film movement plus which is a subscription streaming service uh, about a year a little over a year earlier and although that's a subscription platform uh, which is powered by the Vimeo VHX um, technology. Uh, it had the capability to do transactional products. So we were able to quickly um, create transactional uh, pro products using this platform, which people could then watch in a number of ways because our platform uh, is app-based. So they could watch it on Roku and Apple TV and I iOS and Android and uh, and Amazon Fire and so forth. Uh, and we partnered with cinemas. Uh, it's a little different than what Eve described because uh, what we do is we create a link for each cinema in each film. Uh, and the, the cinemas can promote that link. And it, does, it takes them not to our, uh, our page for the film, although our page on our website for the film does list all the theaters showing it and all, and all of those uh, names are clickable so you can go to that theater's link but it takes them right to the page where it has the theater's logo and the film information and then the customer can buy it right there um, and so we have six films on currently we had the five that we had uh, the three new films Corpus Christi the Wild Goose Lake and Zombie Child which was sort of finishing up its run uh, and then we uh, had also Lino Cente, Visconti's uh, final film, and Donna Flor, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and then we released uh, A White White Day last Friday. And, uh, and we got a lot of press for that, um, which was very nice. So uh, we are finding that, you know, the, the, there's an ebb and flow during the week. And, you know, weekends are when everybody seems to be more interested. Um, the other thing I should mention is that we are also have made this uh, our platform available to other companies that wanted to quickly use uh, launch virtual cinema. So we're we're doing this, doing the uh, creating the links and the, the landing pages for Lightyear Entertainment, for um, a film that they have with Brian Cox, for films we like up in Canada. That's releasing a film up in Canada called The Gray Fox, which is a classic. I think Richard has the U.S. rights actually. Um, and they're releasing it in Canada for uh, Canada Film Day or something like that. I think that was yesterday or today. Um, and also we're partnering with Rialto Pictures, which is uh, 
<clears throat> releasing a couple of films in partnership with Film Forum using our platform. Great. Oh, and Price Point uh, is $12, which seems to sort of have evolved into a standard. I think Richard used also $12 for the most part. Uh, and we're, as Eve said, we're collecting the money. So it is a reversal of the typical relationship with theaters. And then um, we're sending the revenue share to the theaters. Right. Thanks, Michael. And welcome, Richard. Thank you. Your timing is impeccable. Um, Eve, you'll have to catch me up on what I missed in your uh, presentation, although I know a little bit about what you're up to. Uh, sorry for the tech glitches. Any case, um, I'm happy yeah, to report that. Pardon? Yeah, and we've, we've just heard from Michael and Eve, and now it's your turn, Richard, a President and CEO of Kina Law, but tell us about your uh, virtual cinema initiative. Well, um, we were early in the game. Uh, we launched uh, our platform called Kino Marquee on March 19th. Uh, we had uh, faced a challenging situation from uh, the circumstances around Corona with the theater shutting. We had one of our top films of the year launching in theaters physically, Baccarat, the film that won the jury prize in, in this past year's Cannes. Uh, it opened very strongly in New York and LA and uh, within uh, you know a couple of days we had already booked it in 50, 50 markets theatrically in terms of actual theaters. Uh, and then the doors closed. So we scrambled and from about March 11th to March 19th, we converted our TVOD platform, Kino Now, which we had built last year, specifically not setting it up as a subscription platform, but as a pl platform that would do what we do best, which is selling tickets to individual films, not subscriptions. Uh, and that was an open VOD platform, but we saw the value of using that architecture and technology to convert it into a virtual screening platform for theaters. Our commitment from the get-go was to create a kind of film anthropy, as I like to describe it, uh, that would support the, uh, the circumstances of independent and art house films around the country, theaters around the country. Uh, we realized that uh, there would be challenges to get them on board. From the 50 theaters though that we started with in terms of physical booking, within the first launch of Baccarat, from the first day we immediately had 11 theaters that signed on including films at Lincoln Center and some other top, top quality in Lundley chain and so forth. By the end of the weekend, we had 50 theaters that agreed to take the film. And within five days after that, we were up to 150 theaters. We now have over 220 theaters that are showing Baccarat virtually, three times the number that had actually booked it physically. That tells us that the doors open to art house distributors when in fact, we're no longer in a scarcity environment of screens. There were theaters that we actually never get into typically uh, with our physical bookings that were willing to embrace the virtual screening. We immediately followed it with uh, the films from one of our partners, uh, Zeitgeist Films, the Ken Loach, uh, Can Darling, uh, Sorry We Missed You, which uh, performed very well in Cannes. And that immediately found its way into over 120 or 130 theaters. We followed with uh, a lineup of our uh, releases that included third party titles. We had some conversations with some other distribution companies. And the first one we launched with was Good Deed Entertainment. You may remember Good Deed as the company that distributed Loving Vincent a couple of years ago and did over 5 million at the box office. Uh, they had a film that uh, was already planning to open called Extraordinary, which is an Irish comedy starring Will Forte, which is absolute hoot. We took that on and uh, we set up an arrangement where they could do the bookings, uh, but maintain the same price points that we had established at $12 and cover and, and share the revenues with the theaters. So I'm happy to report that a month into our progress, we now have nine films uh, on, on the platform and scheduled, and we'll have two films a week for the next month and a half or two months. This month, at the end of the first month, we're going to be sending over $150,000 to theaters around the country based on their share from participating with us. So we think this is a meaningful uh, business opportunity 
the theater seemed to be pleased and receptive. And uh, as much as we're all championing the reopening of the theaters as early as it makes sense, not as early as Georgia and other states are thinking of doing it, but um, I think there will be supplemental income from virtual cinema for the foreseeable future. And we're still evolving that model, but we're very encouraged and uh, we're, we're keeping at it. That's great to hear. And then, you know, just a couple of sort of administrative questions, really. How long are you making each film available on your platforms? And what are the windows, the release windows after this uh, initiative? We, at the very get-go, uh, we have a very robust theatrical uh, lineup. And we decided that we wanted to maintain the practices of theatrical distribution closest to what the actual realities were. So we typically make the, the, the films available for a minimum of 60 and as much as 90 days. And, and what that means is we make them available with a hold back against any other VOD exploitation. One of the key points in our model is that we're not promoting an SVOD service. We're not promoting our own TVOD service. We're promoting the fact that the films that we're offering are not available on any other, on any other medium. Uh, that said, Many of the theaters now have already committed to take the film well beyond 60 days, even if it does wind up on some other platforms. Uh, we also respect regional clearances, meaning we give the theaters the same kind of so-called territorial exclusivity that they would get in physical terms. We won't open two theaters that are across the street from each other in the same market. There are some theaters that are very sensitive about this, and there are some others that feel that it's not necessary. But again, we're trying to view closely to the, the practices that have, that have determined the, the, the art house distribution patterns over, the many, over many years. Great, and, and even Michael, same question to you about how long you're making the films available and the windows after that. Um, yeah, as I mentioned that, so we went out with The Perfect Candidate as a premium VOD, and we would like to, we will lower the price at some point, but at this point we're sticking to our our windows that we have planned, also with this idea that maybe it will go back and have a, a theatrical run uh, when the cinemas reopen. So, but in general, we'd like to, as Richard said, mirror what we would do. We would have done in a, in a theatrical run space. However, we do look at films in a in a day and date way at times anyway. But in terms of that particular film that we had to change strategies on as a reaction to the cinemas closing, we are we are sticking to windows. We do have a SVOD. Uh, date on it in October, starting on Amazon Prime. So we still have to stick to certain windows in order to keep the, the film moving. Otherwise, we sort of knock everything back. Um, so that's, that's one thing. And then we have another film, White Riot, which we are going to sort of stop and start. We're going to do some special events throughout the summer um, that we were going to do in partnership with music festivals that are all canceled. So at, during the music festival, because it's about uh, the Rock Against Racism movement in the 70s in the UK that was a, culminated in a march from Trafalgar Square to Victoria Park in, on April 30th, 1978, uh, with a big concert, uh, including The Clash and playing White Riot. So next week we're doing a commemorative anniversary screening and online event. Um, and then we'll take it down. That'll be at a premium price, take it down and bring it back for another festival that we were going to do. Um, and then another one, All Points East, which is a London Festival, Glastonbury, Isle of Wight, Latitude, all these different music festivals that we were planning to partner with and show the film and do uh, Q&As from there. So we're trying to replicate that in an offline world with gigs and or online music and Q&As and events. So that's, that's a sort of hybrid of the two, uh, sticking with our preview program um, and having the film available, which is great that we have our own platform because we can have the film available and then take it down again and put it back up again in a way that you would with a series of screenings uh, across the country over a few months. Very good. Michael? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're basically taking the same approach in that we're, we're going to have this theatrical window. It could be as long as the theaters want to be making the film available. Um, if they want to continue to make it available into the time when it's released on iTunes and Amazon and everywhere else, that's, that's fine. Um, but I think for the most part, you know, uh, we have these releases scheduled to come out through those major platforms later, um, and they'll be not available on those platforms while we're doing this theatrical or virtual cinema release. Um, we do have a release that 
was going to be a day and date VOD release on May 8th. Um, actually, it's a British film, A Good Woman is Hard to Find um, with Sarah Bolger. And uh, we had that booked in 10 theaters around the country to meet the theatrical commitment. It's still scheduled for May 8th. Some of those theaters still want to show the film virtually. So we'll have that one, which will be both in virtual cinema and on cable VOD and on iTunes and Amazon and so forth all at the same time. Right. Um, now, the million dollar question, are you able to share any data on some of these individual films? Richard, you've mentioned some uh, you know, some money going back to the exhibitors, but can you give us any information on the data you're seeing so far and the ticket sales? Well, rather than get into specifics of ticket sales, what we're seeing is some very interesting variations in the marketplace where some smaller theaters have overachieved, outperformed, over-indexed, if you will, based upon their strength with community engagement. All the questions that we've had relating to, you know, box office performance and such are using comps coming from traditional distribution. This is a different model. Whereas we found in traditional distribution that, that, that box office returns tend to taper off and diminish as the, the run extends, we're finding an augmentation of income. We're finding that the longer the film runs, the more theaters seem to be coming on board and we're expanding the, the intake of, of revenue based upon films that are, that are longer in the marketplace, which is a very encouraging sign. We have more theaters now booking Baccarat than we did at the very beginning of the run, and they're extending their runs. Um, the, the, the other point that, I, that I'd make here is, whereas everyone in traditional distribution looks at opening weekend grosses and per screen averages, <clears throat> those kinds of comps, those kinds of, of, of metrics are really outmoded in this model because there are so many more theaters participating. We've gone in the art house world from a, a world of, of scarcity to a world of plenitude in terms of availability of screens. <clears throat> Whereas before, you know, we would open a film in, in a physical location, perform very well, but we get bumped in a week or two because it's a calendar date. Here, the films can be held over on indefinitely, and there are literally infinite availability of screens. So all of the metrics that have been the basis of the kind of rent track and comp score modeling are not applicable here. And to just to throw numbers out and throw ticket sales out uh, is, is not, a not, not a valid comparison. All I can say is that we are very comfortable to say that the, the early performance of films most of our films have generated what would be box office equivalent of six figures in terms of the first month. That's re reverse engineering the ticket sales into what the distributor share would be based on a traditional box office performance. And the fact that we're going to be sending checks to the theaters will, I think, give them some encouragement that this is a viable model, that one does not threaten their ongoing commitment to physical, physical screening of films, but can become a valuable uh, additional supplement to their income once films, once theaters do open. The reality going forward is that a sold out theater will in the future be only half full, at least in the foreseeable future because of social distancing. So a box office hit will generate <laughs> in the art house world far less than it would have before the virus. The theaters I think are gonna be responsive to continuing uh, virtual screenings, either as holdovers or as simultaneous a duplex day and date with the, the physical bookings. I think we'll be in a better position to come up with some ways of calculating box office reporting in the next six months after we see what the final results are from the full run of our films. Great, that's really great. Um, Eve, Michael, yeah, could you? Yeah, I totally agree with that, Richard, because we are trying to figure out how do we measure the success of a film. And, and if we had did a preview event and 100, 200 people came to it for a Q&A, we think that was great. Now you think, well, we have you know, billions of people could potentially tap into an online Q&A event, Q event, but that can't be our, our, our metrics that we're using to, to evaluate. So, but now we're getting thousands or you know, even in the, the tens of thousands of people watching events online that would never have gone to the cinema. So that's you know, a success. That obviously doesn't translate into box office because we really are focusing on marketing partnerships with the cinemas and on these events offerings for audiences but the events are free 
and they're not geo-blocked, but the film screenings are not free and they're not geo and they are geo-blocked. So you have to balance out the two on what is the message and how are you getting people there. But we have noticed that the more active the cinemas are at marketing the events or the films themselves, clearly has a result on how much traffic we get and how many transactions we have. So the more active the cinemas, the more participatory they are, the more results, the better the results are for them. So there is, that's, that's something we're really working on, uh, creating a more regional uh, affiliation for audiences so that they feel like they're, they're still supporting their local cinema, even though they're watching it on, on a, a platform that, that serves all the different audiences. Um, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, no, this is good. Uh, go ahead. I, I just, you know, following on that, what's been very exciting is the way the theaters have adopted the whole practice now of building out these virtual screenings. You know, for many years, the theaters were, most of the theaters we did with felt very threatened by VOD and, and the incursions of, of digital viewing. This whole program now is what I think of as a kind of, for the theaters, kind of VOD judo. It basically allows the theaters to redirect the digital income that would otherwise be going to the Netflixes and to the Amazons back into the coffers of the independent theaters. It gives them a chance to curate the digital offerings that are of interest to their customers and benefit while they maintain the, the environment of the, of the theatrical experience. And rather than kind of the Trojan horse fear that the hordes of, of digital customers are going to stop going to the theaters, the theaters are now taking on the mantle of curators and capturing revenues that would otherwise be going to the digital platforms. So this is a very positive development. And I think the most forward looking theaters, you know, will, will continue to embrace this as a new revenue stream for them. Yeah. Michael, did you want to come in on this? Yeah, I mean, first of all, as far as numbers, I mean, I think in general, what we're finding is that uh, for the films that we expected to do bigger numbers, like a Corpus Christi or Wild Goose Lake, the, the ticket sales would be, uh, you know, a, a fraction of what we would have expected in box office. It, that despite the fact that everybody's at home, you know, you, in, in the old model where people would go out to the movie theater on a weekend, more people would do that than would now do this. Um, at the same time, I think some of the costs are significantly lower for us to do this than to be shipping DCPs around and whatnot. Um, and we are also finding um, that the, um, well, a few things about this. I mean, first of all, the theaters, as Richard mentioned, you know, so the theaters have the opportunity to curate. And I think that the theaters that have historically done that and had a clientele that they had built because of their skill in curating and their reputation. Um, and I think of places like Film Forum in New York that have a membership component to their, uh, to their organization and have been a calendar house for so many years and presenting both new films and classics that those organizations have an advantage in this situation that they reach out to their membership and are promoting something, they can get better results than like a local movie theater that people would go to because it's the local movie theater and they would go to see what was playing there. Um, and so we find that even some of the, what may have been bigger theaters before, if they didn't have that kind of relationship they had built over years with their customer base are not necessarily successful in this current environment as some of those other theaters are that maybe could be smaller or depending on the situation, might not have done as much box office as some other theaters historically. Um, so, and, and I think that as far as what Richard was saying about virtual cinema continuing, absolutely. This does give those cinemas a chance to do two things, to offer things that they maybe didn't have the space to offer before because something else was in the way, some other films that they had, or to keep a film that was doing well around longer. If it wasn't doing well enough to maintain a physical theater, it can still be doing well enough for them to continue to offer it online. And I think that this model will continue then beyond the pandemic, um, even if there's a return to some sort of normal. Right. So as far we'll, as the splits, I just see a lot of people are asking about the splits with the theaters. It's a 50% split. Right. That's what we're doing. And I believe that's what Richard's doing as well. 
Yeah, yeah, we haven't been doing 50 split, but we are talking about that now as the model evolves and it really is much more connected to the cinemas and their brand and their identity themselves. Um, and the other thing we've been doing is reaching out more to non-theatrical groups and venues and communities, people who would have normally done community screenings and getting them to host their own group screenings so that we'll see you know, transactions in the night uh, that are the same that if you'd had, had a non-theatrical screening uh, locally and then people organize their own Zoom Q&As after. And again, that's where I think that there's a lot of work to be done on creating this um, feeling of, of going out almost or participating in, and, and this, the film experience being something that maybe you couldn't have got there and even if it is open or you couldn't go, but you could still participate. But one downside to the coronavirus a lot, virus is a lot of people are furloughed, so the cinemas have less or fewer resources to spend on this as well. So we're trying to make it as easy uh, for them to generate the message around the films that we're, we're offering and the events that are there. Yeah, so, so what we're hearing from all of you is that while the paradigm is changing, we're not comparing like to like now because things have changed for the time being, but your theatrical partners on these initiatives so far seem to be the happy and the uptake is, is constant and ongoing with these films. Um, I see it as an extension of theatrical rather than a different rights. Yeah, I mean, I think the, 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 we have to acknowledge the fact that it, even if the, the ticket sales are there, movie theaters subsisted not just on ticket sales, but also on selling popcorn and soda. I mean, that the concessions are a big part of what theatrical income. And there's no way that this is making up for what the theaters are losing by being shuttered. But what it does allow the theaters to do is to have something that they can talk about with their customer base and continue to interact with them. And I think that that's vitally important for them, regardless of how much money they may be making from this at this time, although that's certainly important as well. But it's important for them to have something that allows them to continue to maintain that connection with their customer while they're shuttered. Yeah, the most, the, the most um, significant uh, practice that has emerged in the art house community over the past few years has been the concept of eventizing. And uh, eventizing is creating uh, something unique that goes beyond the frame of the film, that moves beyond the, the, the world of, of mechanically reproduced image and creates a unique experience for, for participants. The uniqueness of, of eventizing in the virtual screening world is, is, is very relevant now because the, there's an opportunity to expand the conversation to thousands of people. Uh, our, the first uh, film that we're actually launching uh, initially in virtual screen, in the virtual screen world, is a, a documentary called Capital in the 21st Century, based on a best-selling book by Thomas Piketty. It's the three million copies sold bestseller in New York Times, Wall Street Journal. We had big plans for this film to open uh, on physical screen, screens, and we took a big gulp and said, I think we can do this virtually. So on May 1, on International Workers' Day, we're going to open this film, and we're launching it with a, a conversation with the author of the book, Piketty, hosted by New the New Republic, which is you know, a leading progressive magazine and, uh, that's been around for many years. And we're expecting very, very wide tune into this conversation. We also have the editor of, of Financial Times and other economic uh, experts. We like the fact that this film is all, the film itself is all about the inequitable distribution of wealth in, in the world. And we think that the, it's relevant to the, actually the process that we're going through by returning monies to the theaters that otherwise would be going to the big giant VOD corporations. So from a foreign content point of view, we think uh, capital is going to prove the point. We hope it proves the point to us that it was worth doing. <laughs> yeah, that'll be very timely. And it'll make people like me who've had the book on my shelf for three years feel like I've actually read the book. It's, um, only, 800, it's only 800 pages. I know. Now, quickly, uh, so we're going to get on some questions from our audience in about five minutes. But with all this, just tell us about how you had to adjust the deals with your filmmakers without the traditional theatrical release. Were there substantial changes that had to be made with your partners? No. Uh, no. I'll just say, yeah. As I said, I think it's just an extension of the rights that we have anyway, and eventually it would go on to some form of VOD platform. It's just okay. accelerating it. And you know, in the UK, we don't have the same constraint, constraints as a lot of European territories on um, technology of media and windowing. 
So, but on, you know, as I said, on the perfect candidate, we did, we had planned a traditional full window release. So I did need to consult with the sales agent, the producer and the director. And it, it was a, it was a difficult decision to make because it was, you know, mid-March. So it was a little bit before we knew exactly what was going to happen. The film had come out in Germany, was doing very well and got shut down after two days. It was coming out in France in the beginning of uh, April and they decided to postpone it. The US is scheduled for May, June and it's still not entirely decided what's going to happen. And there we were in the middle of this <laughs> campaign. We'd had done events with the director with Haifa El Mansour for International Women's Day in London. I mean, she came, if you can imagine, and we did a full house screening with her at the BFI South Bank. And we were ready to go. We had a you know, tube campaign, full London underground uh, campaign going up. And uh, you just get to the point where you, you have to make a commercial decision, but also I had to have the full endorsement that is tough for a producer. They wonder, does this set a precedent that, that isn't right for the film industry or is it right? Is it just the natural evolution? Are we going in a direction that we should have been going in anyway to allow audiences more choice and films to especially independent films to have wider shelf space or longer, longer time to breathe and find, find their way. So, but it was, it, it, it's tough. And again, as I said, with White Riot, we're doing this kind of eventized stop and start over the next uh, few months. And again, we had a long conversation with the sales agent and the producer to make sure that was the right, right thing. And then we have another film with Werner Herzog and he had all this week of sold out events planned for him and that all got canceled in mid-March. And uh, we decided that we would wait until September and just see what happens. Um, okay, let's um, look. Well, uh, uh, let's go to some audience questions now because I think it's time to take take some questions from from our viewers. Um, so we'll start off with one from Annery Bohr, uh, and this is touching on something that you've all um, just mentioned earlier. What what are you finding to be the biggest marketing challenges to gain uh, audience share in your releases? Any of you? Um, well, the, the, the marketing challenges to a great extent fall on the capabilities of the theaters themselves to activate their base. The theaters that have a, a subscription audience, they, they are members of a film society, uh, uh, they subscribe to a theater's newsletter, uh, et cetera. Those are the theaters that are able to you know, uh, advance the curation model and in, engage the, the, the audiences to share their ticket price with the theater. I think that's the biggest challenge. That said, we are still hiring publicists. We're still doing a national social media. We're still promoting the films to the greatest extent possible on, on a national basis, but it's not costing us as much, frankly, as when we would take ads in the New York Times to support the opening weekend. Yeah, we're finding the same thing. Uh, you know, it, it's, we, we put together for each theater, we're putting together a packet of social media assets to help them with the outreach. But as Richard mentioned, you know, the ones that have the mailing lists and have the followers on social media can inevitably do a better job. But we are doing uh, publicity. Um, you know, we were very happy, a white, white day. This is interesting, actually. So white, white day, we didn't get any New York City theaters on board with the opening uh, last Friday, but we did get a review in the New York Times. And in the past, the New York Times wouldn't review a film that wasn't opening in New York City. But now, because the film is available online, and it was available in some, some, uh, through some theaters virtually that are outside of New York City, we were reviewed anyway, and we got a critic's pick. So of course, this Friday, we'll have some New York City theaters on board. Uh, because we also got reviews in LA and, and Washington. Uh, but you need to have still press, you still need to do publicity, you still need to set up the film, you still need to do, as Richard mentioned, you know, national social media. Um, but we are spending somewhat less. I mean, the, the potential to sell tickets is somewhat less, the spend is also going to be somewhat less. Yeah, and I think beyond the theater marketing and the traditional uh, film social media campaign, uh, we've been working with, as we do, in, in a normal releases working with outreach groups or impact campaigning and so really trying to find people who also have their mailing lists beyond the, the, the theater memberships is who do they talk to who, who I would their mailing list be interested in, in our film and what we're doing so that's that's been a key component really is the outreach so that we're targeting the marketing in different ways on, and all online so yeah you're you're competing with a lot of 
other information online, but you also can find an, an audience, I think a captive audience if you're, if you're getting the messaging out there. But yes, newness, freshness, topicality, reviews, features, is all still super, super important. And we've yeah. actually just partnered with Little White Lies who are doing a uh, online competition around your own home cinema and what you're doing to make home viewing um, more interesting or more enjoyable. And so just partnering with them has led to a lot of interesting conversations around the films we have and how we can further our market, marketing outreach. We're, we're, we're also obviously saving money by not having to fly talent all over. <laughs> I said, yeah, we did an event the other day that would have cost a fortune and uh, everybody did it from home with their hair, you know, in a ponytail and no makeup. It was great. <laughs> and, and Jeremy, you didn't have to fly us to LA to be in your office to do this interview, did you? <laughs> well, that's right. That's right. Um, so I didn't have, have to pay for Jeremy's hair and makeup either. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll send you my per diem though, in any case. No, but, but I mean, we're, we're joking about it, but that is a, it is a reality, of course. Yeah. That it, it doesn't it's replace really a live nice. event, but it, it means that you can get access to talent a little more easily and a little bit more economically viable and reach a wider audience with one event. So, for sure, it. for sure. That's very important, absolutely. I've got another question here for Richard. We're going to have, try and address questions to each of you. We've got quite a few to get through. A few people have asked this, and you've touched on this already. What continuation of this virtual cinema initiative do you, you see um, possibly taking place once the theatres reopen. And I know, Richard, this is something you and I have talked about and we've quoted you on screen about this. We're um, obviously rooting for the theatres to come back. And uh, again, that popcorn, that smell of popcorn is something that's, that's seductive. We want people attending their, 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 their theatres, the communities to join again. But to be realistic with the expectation of social distancing, as I said, a, a sold out show will be, mean a theater that's half full. And to supplement the income, I think the theaters are gonna need to find other ways of, of making those films available. It's what I call the law of surplus, surplus promotional value, which is to say when a film opens, it creates awareness that, is, uh, that, that, that generates interest beyond the actual attendance of the actual film. Uh, a film plays for a week and it's gone. With the availability of virtual screens, the film can be held over indefinitely and the theaters can still harvest that surplus promotional value that is not possible when they have to kick the theater, the film out of the theater. We, we see that um, the future may involve what we're calling kind of a duplex release where we make the films available to the theaters physically and virtually we might stagger the windows. We might say, okay, look, open it for the first week, physical only. If the theaters are worried that if it's available virtually, they, people won't come to the theater. We're willing to work with them on any basis they want. If they don't want any virtual screening, that's okay. But at the point where I think they wake up to the realities, they're going to need the, the virtual screens to supplement their income, whether it's, it's at the same time the film is playing physically or whether it's a holdover. So we, we think this, this kind of duplex model is, is the reality uh, going forward. Yeah, it's a big point actually. Even Michael, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I totally agree with everything, Richard, and I won't spend too much time on it other than they think they need to be perceived or um, positioned as equal value. So whether you're going to the cinema to watch it or you're watching it at home. So there can't be seen that, you know, like, like it used to be direct to video wasn't a good thing for them. If you go direct to virtual uh, screening or, a digital release or in tandem or this duplex model, it should be seen as it's a choice based on what you can do, what your availability is, what your budgets are, you know, where you are geographically. So I think that there is some work to be done to, to create, especially when cinemas reopen, that it's, it's, a, it's a positive extension of, of the theatrical release that allows, allows you to make a choice. And sometimes you'll go to the cinema and sometimes you'll watch it, but you still have it available as a, as a virtual cinema experience. So, right. I think, I think film movement, you have a ticket, an actual ticket that you get when you buy it. Right? So, uh, well, not exactly, but we've certainly <laughs> been promoting the idea of a virtual ticket. But, but I, I, I think, I, again, not to spend too much time on this, but I think Eve and Richard are absolutely correct about this. And we've already heard directly from customers who have said that they love this and they hope that this continues because they, they don't necessarily find it that easy, especially some older customers that don't find it that easy to get out of the house and get over to the movie theater and the, to be able to support the theater and watch some things that were curated by the theater is something that they hope will continue. 
Yeah, yeah. On that, we do have part of hearing and audio description and even live uh, and closed captioning and then live subtitling on our events that has been, it's been great because we've seen a very uh, big uptake in terms of more inclusive audiences that maybe couldn't go to the cinema, as you say, or didn't feel like the access materials were available to them. So that well, that's interesting. Open yeah. Bridget, please. I, I just want to say that, you know, I think there's so many exciting areas where this model can spin off to create new value. One of the things that we're seriously looking at right now is creating something that I'll call a kind of virtual movie pass, where uh, theaters that are taking on virtual screenings might allow uh, the sale of a subscription to their, their, their audiences for the virtual screenings on an ongoing basis, even as they're still physically showing the films in theaters. Uh, and that's gonna you know, be something that we're gonna look at very closely. We're also looking at syndicated uh, ring fence offerings, if you will, within certain communities. So for example, we're just launching a project with Unifrance to release a collection of, of short films by French filmmakers, award-winning films, amazing films. And we're doing this, uh, we'll do this through Unifrance, we'll do it through the theaters that take, that are lovers of French cinema, and we'll do it in partnership with the, uh, the Alliance Francaise throughout the country, of which there are over 30 branches. So there are ways of creating uh, specialty circuit releases, if you will, on a syndication model, even as we're also looking at a, 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 at a national uh, VOD subscription, at, at, at a virtual screening subscription model. Right. Okay, well, we, we'd love to hear more about that. We haven't got enough time to hear about all these things, but I, I have to ask this as well. Um, and this is something you've all just referred to. Robert McCann Finn has asked this question about information on the demographics of your uh, audiences now under these initiatives. You've referred to older people. I mean, can you share a bit more about uh, any surprises or what you're learning from your audiences? We don't, we don't get demographic information on, on the customers. Um, you know, it's, uh, we, we have email addresses and that's it. So, uh, but the, the, the fact that we heard from some older customers were just because they told us they were when they happened to reach out with a specific comment. But other than that, we don't have any demographic information. We, 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 back, into demo, we back into demographic information through our customer support line, where we find people asking questions about how do I get this to play on my Apple TV? And uh, so we, we determine some varying levels of technical sophistication among our audiences, but that doesn't really bring us to any conclusion. Yeah, okay. we did a bit of an analysis on our social uh, media campaign and where the uptakes were, and that sort of came out you know, in par on par with what we were targeting in the first place. But actually, through the other platforms we were, we were working with, Curzon Home Cinema and BFI Player, we have had a little bit of an analysis. And we were surprised with slightly more male skewed for The Perfect Candidate, which I really saw as much more of a female film, but that could be a technology issue. I mean, I'm not trying to be gender stereotype, but I don't know. So it was older audience and then a younger audience and it's sort of slightly male than female. So that these were not scientific, but there was, and that could be because of the membership base as well. But we were yes. surprised that there was a stronger male skew than female that I had anticipated. Well, anecdotally, that's really interesting. Now, let's just move on to something else. A lot of questions coming in on this subject. So Leah Ronaldo has asked, so where do you feel film festivals fall into this new distribution model? Obviously, festivals are up in the air right now, being postponed, being reconfigured. We don't know what's going to happen. But how do your festival partners figure into, the, into these um, releases going forward? Well, I, I think it's potentially they can figure in uh, similarly to the way they have before, depending on what they're doing. I mean, it, th there's no reason you can't have a virtual festival screening the same way you have a virtual theatrical screening. And the festivals also have their own outreach and their own customer base that they could market to. Um, and so we're talking about doing something with a festival in New York. The festival itself is canceled, but they want to offer an event uh, and a screening for uh, a new release to their audience. And so we would look at doing that uh, ahead of doing a general rollout to cinemas. I, I would you know, support that approach. And you know, we look at our model as a one-to-many model, meaning releasing basically one or a couple of films at a time to many theaters at the same time. The festival model is many to one, which was to say many films being offered to one contained group of audiences in one market, usually. And 
the, the models, the platforms that we have aren't ideally built for that. We would need to go back and, and rebuild, which we consider doing. We've been approached by a number of festivals that asked us if they could basically license or rent our platform for the festivals. I, I think it's, it's, it's a possibility, but it's not uh, as realistic as working with some of the more established platforms that are already in place for the festivals, like the, the, the CAN platform, the Sinando that operates the uh, CAN Marche is creating a virtual festival in lieu of the CAN Film Festival this year. That's a platform that's established in the market and I think they're the right ones to do that. Yeah, so there's two ways that festivals impact us as distributors, as we know, one is to buy or acquire films and see them in the first place and then secondly to launch them in the marketplace once we bought them. So without festivals to see films, it is hard. If there are virtual screenings or virtual marketplaces, that can work. I think it depends. <laughs> I, I think it's great that Cannes is doing it and, and, and big sales agents are participating. So we'll see how that works. But in terms of regional or national festivals, we just work with them if they're planning to go virtually to work in the same way. You know, some are canceled, some are postponed, some are uh, unknown what's going to happen. Some are going yeah. digitally automatically. So we just adjust. But as, as Mike said, and Richard reiterated, it's just an extension of what we're doing anyway as a preview screening, whether they're at the festival or online. Yeah, for sure. The big uh, thing um, is yeah, how the market will find its way <laughs> this year. Yes, yes. And, and you know, you've all mentioned um, the, the tech and the platforms that you've uh, worked with and you've been modifying. People are asking, you know, geo-blocking and the tech challenges, have they been significant? Are there some issues? I mean, I imagine all these issues are surmountable, but have you faced a lot of tech issues with your platforms and with limiting them, ring fencing them to certain geographical areas, if you will? Well, I mean, I think, you know, geo-blocking within countries is not problematic. Um, and so we have titles that are available just in the U.S. We have, because we're, we're uh, doing this for films we like up in Canada, there's a title that's just available in Canada. So that hasn't been problematic. Uh, technical issues, there are two kinds. There are problems with the platforms themselves sometimes. Um, there was a major outage that Vimeo had a couple of weeks ago. It would happen to be on a Friday night. It was not a good time to have an outage. Um, so that caused a lot of problems. Um, they've ramped up their capacity since then. So hopefully that doesn't happen again. Um, and then as Richard mentioned, there are problems with people unused to the technology, trying to figure out how to take something that they've paid for and get it onto their television. Um, and so that's sometimes a challenge for customers. We, we um, um, built our platform ourselves basically we looked at uh, Vimeo and, and VHX and we had established a couple of sites for TVOD with them on, uh, in some other areas before all of this. We decided that most of those platforms, notably Vimeo, was really designed to uh, privilege SVOD services. And we felt that the transactional aspects of a virtual cinema requirement were not suitable to Vimeo. So we went back to the to basics and looked at retooling our Kino Now TVOD platform to adapt to the needs of virtual screens for theaters. We worked with a back-end developer named uh, called Zeit, did a great job for us, and our site builder who we've been working with for years, Cyber New York, uh, built the, the the front uh, the front porch of our of our websites, and we're continuing to adapt the the sites with them giving us a lot of new flexibility and allowing us to try some new approaches in the market, some of which I've described before. So, um, you know, the, the technology can become horrendously expensive. We're trying to do it in as reasonable a way as possible, but so far so good. Yeah, that's the same with us. We, we've used just our in-house system and then uh, expanded our e-commerce offering to include a digital download space. So it's all very protected through the service provider. Um, the, we have, we, and we have customer service, so if people don't understand or it doesn't work, we help them out as quickly and as easy as we can. But one thing we have had complaints about is the price point. And uh, mostly we just explained that the reason it's that price is because it's in lieu of a cinema ticket and, and until the theater is either reopen or it moves down the, the chain should be wide, more widely available digitally and then on, on SVOD, they just have to wait. And most people actually then say, oh, thanks for letting me know, I understand. <laughs> you know, so I understand that people don't have a lot of money maybe for entertainment at the moment, but mm -hmm. equally it's not, not 
Right. We, we like we like we like to remind people that the twelve dollars that they're paying for a ticket gives them in our platform a five day pass to see the film, and we assume that there'll be more than one pe person watching it. So it's a pretty good value that one ticket buys you a whole family viewing. Although I wouldn't say all of our films are suitable for family viewing if you have young children, but. Um, it, we had a family film yesterday that we celebrated for World Day. <laughs> that was very good. So we could market that's it. That's good for you. That, that's, that's a good marketing angle. We're not, we're not in that business per se at this point, but it, it is a good value for, for yes. the whole. The exactly. whole Communication yeah. is key. People love to hear back from you. So our kind of customer service line, which I, I use the term quite uh, uh, loosely because it's just us really in-house managing it. But uh, it's nice to talk to people and hear what they have to say and what they're kind of, right. how they got to the site in the first place and what their interests or concerns are. Absolutely. And now, Eve, I have a question for you. Uh, there's a couple of people that come in from our viewers, and uh, you've touched on this earlier. The question people are asking, does the virtual dis uh, cinema distribution platform compete with VOD? Um, but as a, perhaps an all rights buyer, it wouldn't for you. But can you just talk us through that again? Yeah, we haven't actually got to that position yet because we're doing this premium VOD and it's, uh, the films that we have are only available on select platforms and then they would go more widely. So, um, they shouldn't in the way that VOD platforms compete with each other all the time. And it's just, why does one person go to one platform over another? How do they choose it? And our point of difference really is this curated space and the partnership with the movie theaters themselves is, is what's, it's what's different for them. And the live events, the access to the talent and the information all in one place is yeah. what we're, we're trying to create as much more cinematic feel to it. So yes, of course, and you know, we work closely with Curzon Home Cinema, who, you know, they are very different, but they're also very similar to what we do, um, or the BFI player. So it's, it's all about branding and, and finding the right audience for that, that space. Absolutely. Yes, yes. Yeah. So Michael, question for you from Debbie Elbin. Uh, do you feel you need more content now than ever before? And of course, you're actively looking for content, but just tell us about the challenges of, of, of buying today. Well, uh, I mean, I think the biggest challenge is the cancellation of, of markets and festivals. Um, you know, the, I was about to go to, the, to, to Austin for South by Southwest and then everything was canceled. Uh, I was hoping to go to Cannes and see a lot of films. And, and for, for me, I, I certainly find that being able to be somewhere else away from the office and the ability to watch three, four, five films a day is a great way to see a, a lot of new films and, and to find things that we want to buy. And watching them virtually, while it may be convenient in some ways, it's, it, it's harder to get yourself out of everything else that's going on and really focus on looking at all the things that are available when it's a virtual market. So I think, uh, and also, you, you don't, you know, at Cannes, you would hear buzz, the buzz about something. Oh, you know, did you hear about this film? It's great. Somebody saw it yesterday. You don't have that same kind of interaction with our colleagues at other distributors uh, or with publicists and festival bookers that you have at a festival. So I think that's a big challenge for us going forward until the festivals start happening again. Yeah, of course. And then... Um... We're just going to uh, just quickly go through a few more. One for you, Richard, from Eddie Gaines, who asks, could you be releasing films from your back catalog um, at reduced prices through this initiative? That, that's a good question, Eddie. Uh, you know, we have a large repertory division. Uh, we have over 400 titles in, in, in repertory release. Uh, what we've been doing is focusing on the repertory titles that are newer acquisitions, titles that we have not yet brought to the the VOD ecosystem uh, in terms of, you know, streaming platforms and such. And for those new acquisitions, including the film that Michael's releasing for us in, in Canada, uh, Gray, Wolf, uh, Gray Fox, which we own worldwide, uh, and we'll be releasing in, in repertory in, in U.S. soon, uh, the, the, the value is still going to be $12 for a new repertory title in the same sense that when we play repertory films in physical theaters, there's no reduced ticket price. But with older titles that may already be on platforms, we're putting together bundles. So for example, we have all the key films of Lena Verdmuller. We have Swept Away, Seven Beauties, and, and so on and so forth. 
it makes sense for us to put all seven of them together and make them available as a bundle price in connection with the theaters that are showing them. So we'll, we'll be looking at different pricing strategies as we go through uh, the catalog. But the first thing that we want to do is make sure that our most recent acquisitions, which are always restored from negatives and their notable events to bring to, to cinemas, will have a premium price point. Right. Okay. And then we've got you have Kino Now, which has your back catalog available digitally. Kino Now is a national TVOD platform, and it has everything. We are currently have a thousand of our titles. We have about 3,000 titles in our library, but we have a thousand titles, or almost a thousand titles on Kino Now. And that includes the, the classics and such, but the titles that we're releasing through Kino Marquee on, and on virtual theatrical screens are not available on Kino Now and they're not available on Netflix or, uh, or, or, or Criterion or Mubi, et cetera. So that's how we differentiate and that's the basis in which we maintain a premium price point for the repertory. Yeah, well, I think we're gonna to have to wrap it up shortly, but I think we'll have one final question that's coming. We've got a lot of questions here. We can't get through all of them, but they're great questions. From Emma uh, van der Putten from Glasgow Film Festival. Uh, I hope you pronounced your name correctly, Emma. And the question is this, um, how do you all see traditional windows developing going forward? What, if you just gaze into your crystal ball, uh, it's hard to say what's gonna happen, but how do you see these windows evolving uh, in, in the months ahead? Well, I, I'll just jump in. I, I think the, the, the one anxiety that some of us have is whether or not the, the virtual theatrical release is going to conflict with the commitments we have to the other VOD platforms that we work with that require availability to the likes of iTunes and Amazon at the same time that we make them available to any other platform. Right now, we feel that this is a new window. This is a different window than, than the VOD or the TVOD window. And, if, and, and so this virtual theatrical window is something that we have to defend as, as a new opportunity in the marketplace that doesn't conflict with traditional uh, VOD windows. Yeah I, yeah, I think we have touched on that. And we just, when the cinemas reopen, to really perceive it as a partnership with the theatrical run and release is, is important for the sustainability of the model and keeping the value of that virtual streaming. And I'll just add that early conversations that we've had with our friends at Apple and others have been very supportive of what we're doing because they realize keeping the theaters healthy and allowing these specialty films and these gems of cinema to get the kind of the full uh, blush of attention that they get in, in theatrical release creates ultimately more value for them when they do find their way to the, the VOD platforms. Michael, final thoughts on that one? No, I mean, I agree completely. Um, I, I, think, uh, I think this is, we also see this as a separate window. We don't see it as competing. Um, you know, we're not, I think, you know, you look at the, the, the uh, what the major studios are doing with their premium VOD, charging $20 for a rental, uh, putting it on all the major platforms and cutting out the theaters entirely. Um, you know, we're not doing that. We're working with theaters. It's not available widely. It's not available on some other major competitor of an iTunes or an Amazon. And it is a premium price rental. It's not $20, it's $12. Um, and, it's, it's, uh, and it allows us to generate the press and the marketing that is helpful when it does make its way to the next window. That's right. a point though, Michael, because we can't partner with multiplexes or, or cinemas that adhere to strict window policies because they won't take the films that are available even at these times under premium VOD. Although I, I hear rumblings of uh, changes even there. So, but that, that's, that's something to, to think about with the cinemas that we partner with. Yeah. Well, thank you for your thoughts on that. Look, we could talk for a long time. We've got a lot of questions, but um, I think we have to wrap it up there. And before I exclusively reveal uh, next week's talk session, let me just say thank you to all of our viewers who've uh, logged on and engaged with your great questions today. Thanks to our panelists for your expertise, your insights. Good luck with your initiatives. Um, and thank you to our online editor, Orlando Parfit, for moderating and uh, enabling the session. We'd love to hear which topics you'd like to see covered in the future. Uh, send your ideas or comments to screens editor Matt Mueller at mats.mueller at screendaily.com. Today's talk uh, will be available on demand on screendaily.com tomorrow. And next week, we'll present our first one-on-one -on -one interview with Ben Roberts. 
the new CEO of the British Film Institute. That will take place on Tuesday, April the 28th at 4.30 p.m. UK time. Meanwhile, thank you very much. Until then, take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>